Praise the Lord. What a joyful day it is to be in the presence of the Lord, to sing of his wonderful love for us. Amen. As a church, uh, the Spirit of God is awakening the young and old alike to intercede for many in, uh, that are needed in prayer, and especially for our dear sister who is in the hospital. And, uh, you know, this is a time where prayer is the need of the hour. Prayer is our way of acknowledging the sovereignty and the power of God above human wisdom and human might. Prayer is, is our way of humbling ourselves and submitting our requests in the hands of the one, the only one, who can solve every problem that we face in this broken world. So let us continue to pray with hope and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, constantly interceding on our behalf. Amen. Now I would like to move forward with our series uh, in the book of Acts. We have about five more messages left in this series. And God has been good, amen, uh, leading us through this book and teaching us many things from this historical narrative of the early church. And so let us turn to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. As we turn there, let me just give a short summary of uh, where we are. Um, I, I can't give a complete summary. Uh, we, I think every time we give a message, we sort of summarize what happened before. But uh, we'll keep this brief. Um, as we know, Paul willingly chooses to travel to Jerusalem following the Spirit's prompting, and uh, he's going to Jerusalem to even die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Jerusalem, he encounters a series of conflicts. He makes peace with the, the existing church members there who, uh, who have a, the notion that Paul is there to discredit Moses and to uh, and te uh, teaching things that uh, against the law of Moses. And so he finds a way to make peace with the brothers in Jerusalem. And then he finds himself in the crosshairs of the Jewish rulers. And, and he's not doing anything to cause any ruckus or anything like that. They identify that, that Paul is in their midst. And then a false rumor comes out that Paul is bringing in Gentiles into the temple. And so we have these Jewish rulers that think that he's trying to destroy, uh, Paul is trying to destroy Judaism, and so he, they, you know, they make a, uh, they, they start, you know, um, persecuting him. And then he also finds himself in front of Roman rulers. You know, they don't care about the religious arguments. They don't care about the doctrines. They, they just want to keep law and order. They don't regard much for the Jewish people. Um, and, you know, they, they just want to keep, make, make sure there's peace because, these, when the, if a Caesar or a higher level authority hears that there is turmoil going on in any of the territories, that looks bad on the Roman rulers. So the, their only interest is to make peace and, and to keep things calm. So Paul finds himself in front of them because these Jewish rulers are accusing Paul of uh, causing, uh, being an instigator of chaos. And when we look at Paul himself, and, uh, and I just want to bring a character study into Paul just real quick. Paul is a unique character in this whole narrative. And, and the more we understand why he is unique, we'll understand the wisdom of God in, in tr why Jesus, why God selected this man to be the messenger and the witness of the gospel, not only to the Jews, but to also to the Gentiles, mainly for the Gentiles. And, and uh, Paul knows the inside game, you know, of, of this Jewish council. And because he's been part of it. He has a theological depth in knowing the religious arguments because he was a student of Gamaliel, one of the uh, elite teachers of the law in that time. He's a Pharisee, and he's a, sons, a son of Pharisees. A, a line, he, had a, he has a great lineage of um, forefathers that uh, have been part of the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. And he, not only that, he was a chief persecutor of the church. He, uh, he understands the zeal the zeal that, that goes to violence, the violent zeal and the anger that the Jews uh, have towards Christians. And he speaks fluid Aramaic. He, he knows scriptures. And now on the other side, Paul has lived the Greek life. 
He, has been, he was born and brought up in Tarsus, in uh, Cilicia, which is one, uh, one of the major uh, cities uh, in the Roman Empire. It's not a small city by any means. And he was a Roman citizen by birth, as we uh, talked about in the previous message. He, was, he didn't buy his citizenship. He was a Roman citizen by birth, which is a higher, was sort of like a higher level of citizenship. He spoke Greek. He knew, understood the, the Greek governmental, uh, the, the, the Roman governmental system. And so we see, we'll see how he uses all of these things, all of his background to become a witness for Christ, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And I say all this to, to make this point that you and I have unique elements in our background that, that make us the right witness for the gospel in particular situations. You will have a door, an open door to minister to somebody unlike the person next to you. And, and, and so you can use your background, your education, your knowledge, your history, your personality, your zeal for the expansion of the gospel. You don't have to reinvent yourself or become somebody you're not. You yourself, with all of your, the, all of your history, you as a person are, have so many different facets about you that you can become a unique vessel of the gospel in, in, in the places that you are planted. So where God has planted you, placed you, is your mission field. You don't have access to my workplace, and I don't have access to your workplace. You don't have access to the places I have been, and I, you, I don't have access to the places you have been. You don't, I don't have access to your school, and you don't have access to where I have been in school. And the people that is around you in your peer group and in your classes and everything like that are the, the same people that you're going to become the ambassador and the letter of Christ to them. They're going to see Christ in your actions. They're going to see Christ in your dealings, in your messages, in, your, in the words you speak. So embrace that uniqueness that God has brought you through so far. Even, even if it was a hard journey, that unique journey Will, will make you a unique messenger of the gospel wherever you are placed. So now let us look at uh, chapter 24. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to step by verse by verse, and then uh, uh, I won't talk about each verse, but just highlight certain things as we read through that chapter. So reading Acts chapter 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since though we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made, in this, made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have, been, we have found this man a plague, one who steers up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him, you yourself will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. So where we are in the narrative is that Paul's nephew, um, which is the only part where he's mentioned, Paul's nephew comes to hear about a conspiracy that certain Jews have taken an oath to eat and drink nothing until they kill Paul. And so Paul's nephew tells this to Paul. Paul says, hey, go tell the tribune. The tribune is a person who's in charge of many soldiers, a uh, few centurions. And so the tribune, Claudius Lysias, he decides to protect Paul. And, take, and we heard this last couple of weeks ago, that he sends with him a large army with him to Caesarea to approach Governor Antonius Felix. And we're going to talk about Felix today morning. And Felix decides to wait until Paul's Jewish accusers Arrive, And so uh, we see that five days later, Ananias, the high priest, and some of the elders come to accuse Paul. And there's a, that spokesman, Tertullus, is a lawyer. He's a very eloquent 
man who, uh, using very pleasant language, he praises Felix. And then he goes into this act, false accusations about Paul that he's a ringleader in a, of this sect, you know, so using strong language to infer some nefarious motive or this, you know, that this man is a dangerous person. This man is a terrorist, um, you know, using false accusations. But then, uh, right after uh, Tertullus had his, made his point, the governor nodded to Paul, and we read in verse 10 onwards, and when the governor had nodded him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or staring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues, or in the city. Neither can prove to you that what they now bring up against me. But I confess this to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So Paul is no, you know, small beans as well. Like he, he is a very eloquent man of himself. Like I mentioned, his education, his background, bodes him well for this moment. Not only that, he has the Spirit of God within him to give him the boldness and the words to speak. And so here we see in verse 14 that Paul makes a distinction that they, this is according to the way. But these people that, that accuse me are calling it a sect. And this phrase, the way, and many of the, you are students of this already know, this is how the book of, the book of Acts describes Christianity as the way. And six times we see this in the book. Luke, Luke likes to use that phrase, the way. When we talked about Aquila and Priscilla, uh, Luke says that, they, that they, both of them explained the way of God more fully to Apollos. And we know where this word, the way, comes from, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Christianity is participating in this way, life, and truth of Jesus. We take up our own crosses daily and we follow the path of Christ. Jesus is the way. This Christian journey, this Christian religion, as we call it, it's not, just, it's not a set of rules, it's not a set of principles, it's a walk. It's a pilgrimage. We are walking to our destination. This is the way towards heaven, way towards the Father through Christ. Verse 15, having a hope in God, which these man's, men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Verse 16, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. So what is... Paul's hope, that his hope in God is that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. It, you know, this whole concept of the resurrection is a point of contention. As we heard in, in previous messages, Pharisees believe that there will be a resurrection. Sadducees believe there will not. And in the Old Testament, there are a couple of portions of Scripture which, which infers to the resurrection. And uh, let me read that real quickly here. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall raise, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Daniel 12, 12, 2. Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this, this whole concept has been in the Old Testament, and there was just a, a strong debate about this whole this whole doctrine. And Paul is saying here that his hope in God is that there will be a resurrection of both the unjust and the unjust. And how do we have this hope? 1 Peter 1.3 says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So our hope in God comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ was crucified, 
Our, our sins was crucified in his flesh. He died. He died a real death. He was buried. And then upon his dead body in the three days, in three days, the spirit of holiness raised him to new life. And he is he was resurrected from the dead. And this this whole thing about Christ being resurrected, you know, I think we, we take it so lightly, but you know, I've been in part of worship services where every time the, 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 in any worse, the resurrection of Christ is mentioned. There's such a, it's a, there's such a, 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 um, a noise in the crowd. Like this is a, a, a shout of victory. A shout of victory and a shout of this truth of Christ being raised from the dead should be a cause of joy for us. Because without the resurrection of Christ, there is no hope whatsoever. There is no Christianity. So that is in which what Paul is taking his ground over and over again. We see, even with the, uh, those in Athens, and I might bring that, I might read that here in a little bit. He, he's arguing about the resurrection of Christ. Now let's keep going. Verse 17. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else these, let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I, I stood before the council. Other than this one thing I cried out while standing among them. With this with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am trial before you this day. That one statement is what caused the ruckus as we read in previous uh, passages and in previous messages we heard. That's the one statement that caused a huge ruckus in the council, the Pharisees and Sadducees arguing, and then the Romans saw that, okay, this is getting out of hand. They pulled Paul out of that, that, uh, that chaos, um, and so that's what Paul is mentioning here. Now keep, let's keep going. Verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them up, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then when he gave orders, uh, then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should pre be prevented from attending to his needs. Verse 24. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So here we read about Felix a little bit more, but we're, we're seeing a character description about who Felix is all about. Let me just highlight one thing before I talk about Felix. We see here that Felix does have an accurate knowledge of the way. So he was able to detect that all the, what all these Jews were saying were lies about what Christianity was all about. And, and the nature of the believers. He may have seen how the early Christians behaved. That these, these are peace-loving. The, uh, these are, you know, the, 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 the fellowship that they have. That they, they don't seek violence. They don't seek chaos. They, they're, not, they're not the instigators of, of, of any of these things. And we see here that uh, in some days after Felix and his wife Drusilla... And Drusilla is Felix's second wife. And for Drusilla, the story is that Drusilla is uh, the daughter of uh, Herod Agrippa I. He's the one who, who died after J beheading James. He had a sudden death. And the, and the, and the historical narrative is that, that Felix uh, enticed Drusilla to leave her husband, who was another king, and uh, they, they became uh, husband and wife. So Felix and Drusilla have the opportunity to hear about the faith in Christ Jesus. And so what is, what is the content of 
I mean, we can imagine what Paul will be talking about. It shouldn't be anything outside of what Paul has revealed through the Spirit in the epistles. But in verse 25, he says, As he reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. So what, is, what was the content of the message? What, 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 what can we take from those three things? Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. What is righteousness? Righteousness is being right in the eyes of God. Scripture says, be, uh, this is what God has commanded, be holy as I am holy. This is the, the righteous decree of God for each one man and woman has ever existed and will ever exist. So how is, so he talks about the faith in Christ Jesus, right? Paul, that's what Paul is speaking about. And then he reasoned about righteousness. So how is faith and righteousness linked? How is the faith in Christ Jesus and righteousness, this, this pure Holy righteousness of God, this complete 100% righteousness of God linked. Well, we know many verses that says that the righteous shall live by faith. Or by Abraham, Abraham believed in his, uh, in, and he was, in his belief or his faith was credited as righteousness. In Philippians we can see, Philippians chapter 3, 8 and 9, and I'll read that here. I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law. Not any kind of self-righteousness of, or, or righteousness that I earn by own, my own doing or my own actions. But a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. A righteousness from God that depends on faith. That, my, that this righteousness that I need to have to be as holy as God is holy comes by faith in Christ Jesus. That great exchange where my sin is placed on Christ and His righteousness is placed on me. It comes by faith alone. What's the second thing? Self-control. How is self-control linked to all these things? There's a verse we know that the Holy Spirit, He, he convicts the earth, He convicts people about what the righteousness and the judgment to come. But then all of a sudden there's this thing called self-control in the middle that seems to Make things about works or something like that. If, you know, we think that faith and works are, can't, can't coexist. But that's not the case. You know, in Ephesians it says that we are saved by grace through faith. And what is this grace? I'm not saying anything that is new. I'm just remi- put, bringing everything to remembrance for us. What is grace? Let's turn to Titus 2, 11 through 14. Let's read what is grace? What is this grace? Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to, for all people, training us. Again, there's an action. Grace is not just a, a get out of free, uh, uh, jail free card. It's a, there's action here. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. To live self-controlled. Here's that word. Upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our glory of, the, of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are jealous for good works. This self control is part of that grace that comes, a saving grace. And we know self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Now, when we talk about self-control, you know, the, when, we, when the world talks about self-control, it, it, come, it becomes about self. You know, my self-realization. My self, uh, the straining that I take myself to control myself. There, there is a lot you can do to control yourself. The world shows that. Without, outside of Christ, there are people that are able to do a lot of things with self-determination alone. But that is not the self-control that that we espouse to. The the self-control that we have is a work of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. That we die to ourself. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't uh, increase ourself. We're dying to ourself. And that's how we are able to control ourselves. That we walk in the Spirit. We don't walk in the flesh and try to use the flesh to control our flesh. We walk in the Spirit and by the Spirit we're able to control ourselves. 
And thirdly, it's judgment. There's one thing that Paul mentions to the, to the Greeks uh, uh, and to the philosophers in Athens. In Acts ch- chapter 17, 30 and 31. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. According to which righteousness? His righteousness. His perfect righteousness. By whom? By a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Christ. uh, Let's visit that again. The resurrection of Christ is the, it has given that, that assurance of this coming judgment. The coming judgment, there's, a, there's ironclad guarantee there will be a coming judgment because Christ was raised from the dead and He is going to be that judge that will be judging the, those who are dead and alive. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed once, you appoint to die once and after that face judgment. Every single person will face judgment in front, in front of Christ. So when we talk about the good news to others, when we share the gospel, we have to talk about these things. The gospel is not just God has a good, good plan for your life. God, God will make you happy and successful. There's a judgment. There's a holy righteousness that He wants to see in those that he judges. And all will fall short of the glory of God. Every single person will fall short of the glory of God, except for those who trust in Christ. And that is the good news. That is what Paul was sharing and reasoning. He was reasoning with Felix and Drusilla. He wasn't just preaching. and He was, he was talking to them, discussing, answering questions. This is how we share the gospel. We don't, we don't just you know, throw out some, some template message. We, we have to reason with people. We have to get into their lives and see how, how to help them process these things. But even in this great conversation that Paul had, what are we seeing here with, with Felix's response? Unfortunately, Felix did not have the kind of response that we would hope when we share the gospel to someone Felix knew about Christianity. You know, that, I mentioned that earlier. He knew a lot of the, okay, this is what Christianity is all about. He, he, he was able to have a, a surface level knowledge. He was able to appreciate the way. So when, but then look at his reaction. When he heard about all these things, he was alarmed. He was frightened. That is a, a reaction that we can see in, in those who, uh, even in the pews, when we, Tough, preach a tough message. Everybody has a little bit of a, like everybody gets a little bit alarmed and frightened. That is a normal reaction. And oddly enough, I mean, at that moment he told him to go away, and then, but then he brought him back over and over again. But we see that it may have been because he likes to listen uh, to, to the preachings of Paul, but it was also because he thought he could get bribes from Paul. So it's the frightening, being frightened in, in itself, any, doing any purpose? No. Even the devil, right? The devil shudders. Right? That's what James says. That it's not just belief alone or, or appreciation of the, of the gospel alone. You could even be frightened and not be changed one bit. So, you know, we see here. I mean, there's also this, you know, bringing him off. And it kind of reminds me of. You know, John the Baptist, you know, and the, and the relationship he had with Herod. That Herod had an appreciation for John, even though John was talking against him in, in what he was doing in the immorality in his life. But So there's this odd respect. And there's, that can happen even in our life. Those who are preaching, those who are sharing the gospel. There are a lot of people who appreciate what we will say. Well, man, I, 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 I admire you for your, like you are a person of a lot of strong beliefs. You know, that, that people may say that to us. That doesn't mean anything. So we see here Felix, uh, he procrastinates, right? He keeps putting off Paul. He, uh, you know, 
he could he could have freed Paul at that moment, but he had other interests. You know, he is a politician. He he uh, he wanted to do Jews a favor, and maybe the Jews gave him a better bribe. We don't know that, but it could be the possibility that he was looking for a, a bigger bribe from Paul than what the Jews were offering him. And so Felix, with with this, you know, constant conversation with Paul leaves unchanged. And that, that is, a, that is a something for us to take hold of, even for ourselves and for when we share the gospel. We cannot expect everyone to be transformed by the gospel message. But we still need to be faithful like Paul was, to go over and over again and to reason and to share over and over and over again because we never know when that time will come. One thing, and I will invite the worship team to come forward. It says, two years later, Felix succeeded by Portius Festus. Felix had the opportunity to let go of Paul, but he procrastinated. For two years, just imagine Paul in prison for two years. And one thing that I keep reminding myself of, is how can how does how is Paul able to remain patient in this moment where he's imprisoned? He cannot be out there preaching the gospel, and it goes back to the encouragement of Jesus, encouraging Paul to press forward. That you were faithful to me in Jerusalem, and now you go to Rome, and that is where Paul's eyes focus is the encouragement of Jesus that he's going to go to Rome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning, O Lord. We want to take an inventory of our life and to see, Lord, have we been transformed by the gospel? Or do we just have a surface level appreciation or just, a, just an empty faith that we just say, I believe, but our lives don't show for it. That there's no growing sense of self-control. There's no growing sense of, of righteousness in us, that things are just stagnant. Lord, I pray by the power of the Spirit that this message of the gospel, the hope of resurrection, the coming judgment, all will bring a sense of conviction in our hearts that we will turn to Christ as our Savior, that we will have faith, we will trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary for us, and that one day we will Behold that blessed hope that we will be found with the righteousness of Christ. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor for all you have done, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.